Hello to you people from around the world. Thank you for joining today. And today we're going to be talking about HashiCorp Vault and its configuration via HashiCorp Terraform and experience I have based working for the last three years with Vault and implementing that for Hippo Technologies. Before we start though, I wanted to bring your attention to this. So, you know, there are different educational techniques and uh, one development technique is to finding different patterns that's what you could do with kids right but yeah and with kids it's fun but it's not so fun when it's happening on your production servers really you don't really want to go and guess why those two are different especially if there is uh, some outage going on or what is worse is that uh, you have an intrusion on security incident where it is particularly important to know why thing looks in particular way. I mean, that they are as you intend them to be. And this is what you can achieve with the infrastructure as code and configuring world via Terraform. About myself, I'm Andre, um, independent consultant, being in industry for more than 10 years. I am doing the conferences, speaking at meetups, also organizing them. I am a sole host on the DevSecOps Talks podcast. So if you want to hear more from me, then tune in there. And uh, I'm helping organizations to build automations, projects, and time to time and fix those projects in organizations. Also, I'm training people in Git, Jenkins, Docker, and lately, Terraform, Vault, and Kubernetes. About this presentation and what to expect, I'm not really pretending to be an expert. It's all based on my experience in the recent projects, as well as like me talking to other people, seeing what they do. Uh, there are going to be a lot of details and technical references. However, you don't need to screenshot them, since the slides will be available online. So the Terraform, one of the tools that we're going to be covering today, that's an infrastructure is called tool from HashiCorp and comes with a lot of great capabilities for you. And the great thing is that Terraform nowadays has providers for everything. So you can configure not only the cloud, public cloud providers, but you can configure, I don't know, ping them, Cisco routers. There are a lot of providers, so it's growing in popularity and the go, a go-to tool for infrastructure is called. Second one is Vault, and it's a secrets management. Gives you a, quite a lot of capabilities, like reducing the secrets pro, so you put all your gems or the crown jewels into the Vault and they are staying safe in there. It allows you to shift from using static secrets to dynamic secrets we're going to be talking about. About that. We're going to be talking more about that. You're also getting a better audit capability since everyone gets a temporary secret and you can trace who got that secret. While like if you have a shared static secret, you don't really know who exactly using it. Like for instance, the root database password that everyone has and you don't really know who is logging into your database and who is doing what. Also, as many HashiCorp tools, well, I would say all, all I think all of them are focused on building multi-cloud capabilities and while there's no exception, it allows you to set up unified identity and abstract from your cloud providers and your private data center. So you have all the audit, all identities managed, all the policies managed in one place. Plus you're getting a break class procedure. Like if you have an issue somewhere, if you have a security incident, there is a possibility for you to revoke some of the temporary credentials that you generated from Vault using Vault as what wouldn't be possible comparing to the shared static credential that is used everywhere so you can just break everything if you remove that one. With Vault every workload gets its own credential and it's safe to revoke one of them. Not, well you, you can do all of them of course but usually you would get into it in one place and then you can revoke that one and you can also spot it easier. There are much more th good things you can say about Vault that I'm not going to do today since the time is limited. And if you're interested, just search for this talk on YouTube and you'll get all of it. So assuming that I convinced you that you have to start with Vault, where do you start? It's 
good to clarify the context and connect your requirements. And so also the questions that you can ask, how you're going to deploy, you're going to be running on bare metal, VM, container, will you patch or scratch? When I said, I mean, will you do like a mutable infrastructure thing when you bake the golden image and just redeploy the new golden image that already has everything inside? Or will you constantly update your installation by logging in via some automated tool and installing updates and stuff like that? How do you access? Will it be available on VPN or will it be available on the internet? How do you unseal? How do you get initial secrets like TLS certificates for TLS termination, for instance? And then you also want to lock down this box as much as you can, which means that everything the operators might need from me, you want to stream it to somewhere else, like logs, telemetry, audit files. Also consider how, how your disaster recovery requirements are. Do you need that? So that will also affect the way you set up world. And that might be quite a lot to take in at once. So, you know, seek for the already available best practices like Terraform modules, like Helm charts. Also, the HashiCorp has an uh, amazing resource, learn.hashicorp.com. And it, on that resource, you can find uh, Vault and reference architectures that can give you an idea of what you can do. So there is a quite a lot out there which is ready to use, might not exactly meet your requirements, but it's still it's a good start. It's better than you implement everything from scratch. So you can just borrow some ideas from those templates or telephone specs. Also, we want to harden your Vault installation. And there are quite a lot of things that you want to do, and that's like a minimal readiness checklist, in my opinion. There is more on the link. Also at learnhashicorp.com, few things to highlight. Like one of them is somewhat obvious, but not always. It's like TLS termination. You want all till to terminate your TLS connection signs. If you do terminate the TLS connection on a YLB, talking AWS, and then send all the traffic, and then you'll be sent the traffic to the EC2 box where you have Vault. That traffic goes unencrypted because you terminated TLS on the ELB, and if there is someone in the middle sniffing your network, they're going to see everything that goes there. So you want Vault to terminate TLS for you, and just so your ELB just passing through the old traffic to Vault. Another one to highlight is the audit files. So those you need to enable. And last time I checked, the uh, world was syncing those to the disk, and then you will need to find a way to sync those out from the box where you run into the container. And uh, for instance, like S3 somewhere, right? Have MFA delete so people can delete those files. Like if there is an intruder lurking in your infrastructure and trying to cover its traces, and they might attempt to delete audit files. But if you have MFA delete enabled, it's becoming more harder. And you could even have a cross account replication for that S3 backing. So you're like sending everything to the black hole that that uh, identity, so like users in this account doesn't have access to. And that will prevent you from losing the audit files. Now, assuming this actually assumes that you do both parts with Terraform. Like if you do deploy it to the Kubernetes to use it help, that doesn't really apply. But well, it's actually like you're already splitting your wall deployment and your wall configuration in two separate specs. So like with Kubernetes, you already have Vault, uh, the Vault Helm chart, which deploys your Vault instance, and then you have Terraform specs that configures your Vault instance. If you do EC2, for instance, then uh, that's what I mean here. You want to separate. So one will be for the wall deployment. There you will have your EC2s, ELB security groups, after scaling groups, what have you. And the second one is the part where you actually engage vault provider for Terraform and configure the vault itself. The reason for that is if you do rolling update, for instance, it might be so that for fraction of the second your vault connection blinks because one EC2 instance went away, another one is coming up, and maybe there is some phishing going on in the LB. And if in that second the Terraform tries to access a vault IPI, it will be unavailable, and your deployment or your allowed will stop. 
and you will be like in a no man's land. It's like unfinished deployment. You change some resources, but you haven't finished it. And then you will most probably have to manually revert back or, or repeat it again. So you might get yourself into trouble and get your world completely locked out. And uh, that's why it makes sense to run those separately. And obviously, I, I mean, like you want to run them often, like weekly to make sure that there is no configuration drifts, uh, no malicious changes done in the configuration. So your whole configuration is exactly as you intended to be. So now you got it up and running. What do you do next? Well, to start, you would need to have a little bit of settings on the CLI. In particular, you will need to have environment variable world other, which points out to the world IPI, and you will need to have a token. Actually, if you just started your world, you need to initialize it. And when you initialize in the world, you will get a couple of things. You're going to get five keys, and then you will need three of those to unseal it every time it restarts. If that seems tedious, and it is, then you could uh, fall back to the auto unseal using cloud KMS, or if you have HMS device, something like that. And, uh, and a root token, you will get a root token when you're initiating the world. And that's like a god mode. This token has a god mode and uh, you can do whatever. And the last thing you want is to that token to be stolen from you. So in order to prevent that, when you create the policies, and we're gonna talk more about that, that allows you to manage world using the regular token, just revoke your root token vault token revoke and then the root token ID because it's impossible to steal from you something that you don't have. And you can always generate new ones using those five keys I mentioned before. So, and now, assume that you did all everything on a CLI and you have an idea what you're after, you could start. Well, speaking about idea, you need to understand what world is, how it works, and that will give you an idea where to start. And I usually use this slide to brief, to quickly explain people what the world is about. So on the left, you have an OUS method that allows you to come into world and get a token. Based on the OUS method you use and the metadata provided, your token will get a set of policies, and those policies allows you to access secret engines. And secret engines is a juice of wall. They basically allow you to generate those temporary credentials, maybe retrieve static credentials that you can store in a KV, K value store, or else the world comes with a PKI capabilities public key infrastructure so you could generate certificates for your infrastructure using wall. So that's an example how the token would look like. So I, in this example, I got a token on the CLI. And in the middle, you can see there is ID, so that's important. Then you have issue time, last renewal, you have TTL. And that's important because every token has a limited lifetime, uh, which means that if this token being leaked, attacker will have limited opportunity window to exploit this token. Also, you can see that it was issued using LDAP OS method. So it's my username attached to that. So by doing so then in audit logs, I can see that, yeah, it was me. Actually, this token was me. <laughs> like it's, it's basically me acting in the world using this token, but my LDAP identity is mapped there so I can trace through. And in the end, you see like a second from the bottom, you can see the detail. So this is how long this token is going to be valid. And I can renew it if needed. So OWS methods and policies, it's kind of boring, but it's important science. As I said, you want to get rid of your root token. And that's why we need to have OWS methods so you can get token and you can get the policies that would allow you to manage vault. There are quite many OWS methods available in Vault nowadays, and you most probably will need more than one. You will need to have something for the humans, developers and operators, and you will need to have something for things like your applications, like your CI/CD system, maybe some boards. And they will be different for any application, and you're going to see why. So as an example, I'm going to use LDAP here. 
And uh, the LDAP is actually quite good example science with LDAP. You leveraging existing IAM, and you uh, leveraging existing directory of the identities. You can use another places and wall just falling back to that to validate the credentials you're sending it. And if they are valid, it will give you back token. And it's mostly conven mostly convenient to use for humans because it is inter it's in many ways interactive. So this is how you configure the OWS backend uh, in Terraform. And if you ever configured LDAP, everything you see here will be very familiar for you. And your LDAP server URL, that's your organization structure, the query strings. You will need to provide the bind users that are going to be use, using to verify the credentials you are sending. And you see you have a bind password here. It's good to pass it as a variable or look up it from the wall, but then you have chicken and egg problem. Uh, and uh, keep in mind that all secrets that you share with Terraform will stay in Sheriff Terraform states, and you need to protect Terraform state. This is LDAP removal, which is backend group, actually. So, and purpose of this thing is to map the LDAP group to the world policy. So for instance, in this example, if person is in the DBA LDAP group, it will get DBA policy attached to its token when it's logging in. The policies are complex, and I'm not going to go into details in here because it could be the whole the, the topic for the whole uh, talk, and else it's kind of specific for every organization how they do things. But what you need to know is, uh, as I said before, you need a policy to manage policies, and you need to consider those, creating those first. The policies are denied by default, so you have to explicitly allow something. If it's not explicitly allowed, it's denied. And the uh, LDAP groups, it doesn't really have too much policy names, but it makes sense because then things are kind of predictable. So people say, like, I'm in a DBA group, then most probably I will get the DBA policy. And if you are a member of multiple groups, then the multiple LDAP back and rolls will match and you will get multiple policies attached to the token. Things to consider when you're setting this up, you can specify TTL that people get on their tokens. So for instance, if it's developer and they get a token in the beginning of their work days, then you might want to set it to like six hours or eight hours, you know, the lunch of productive day and uh, also where it could be issued from. So you can bound it to the network you could also set for how long it could be reviewed. So, you know, th those are good things to consider and they will be vary from organization to organization. April, and this really if you have to, because this one is basically login and password and comes with the same disadvantages of missing the audit. And that's mostly used for CI that you host outside of your infrastructure, like for instance, Circle CI, you know, the SaaS offerings. This is how you set it up. You have a backend with no configuration in this example, and then you have a backend role that basically maps the role ID to the policies you get. And you can get that through, and then you get secret ID and role ID using CLI. And those are basically the login and the password, the role ID being login and secret ID being a password. You can get the same through the Terraform here. You just use a secret uh, re resource, backend role secret ID, then use locals to prepare the map and store it to the KV so you can retrieve it from the KV later on. The cloud IAM and Kubernetes are more useful for the, for the non-interactive authorization like your applications, for instance. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about Kubernetes science. I have a separate video so you can check it out on the YouTube. So you got a token. What's next? The secret engines, and those are really nice because you, because you can get the dynamic secrets, they have a limited lifetime, they prevent sharing of credentials because every workload gets its own, and you have a break class procedure and improved audit. So the KV, this is a storage for the static secrets, and those where you, I, I suggest you have two actually, you have one for humans where they can have a messy structure, and then you would read those using Terraform and store them in a the new KV where you have a predictive, predict, predictable structure for your applications to read from. And in that sense, you can make sure that it's the same between 
across all the environments. AWS, you can issue the temporary AWS credentials, and this is how you do it. You first create an AWS user because that one will be used by Wall to issue the credentials, and you attach the policy. That's the policy that you need to attach, and there is a more on a learning on the documentation side. Then you have a backend where you specify the keys that you just generated and the TTLs. You have an actual role that you describe here that will be provided to the people. And then you have a two different credentials. You have assumed rule where you will get uh, STS credentials, or you could have a user and then Vault will create actual user and give you a, a user credentials. In this particular example, I'm using assumed role. So when I am jumping over to the CLI and reading those, I'm getting three pieces. I'm getting access key ID, I'm getting secret key, and I'm getting security token, which is a part of the session ID. The cool thing is that you can use those temporary credentials to generate sign-in AWS console URLs, and that way you don't need any SSO. You just get the temporary credentials, run some script to generate that login li link, and then you paste it to your browser, and after you automatically log in. So no, no need to have any users manage passwords, make sure they renew their keys, and so on and so on. On this link, you can see how you can do it. And for inspiration, there is more stuff. So this is a talk from the last year conference in 2019, and I find it very insightful and very inspirational about what you could more you can do with Vault. So check that out. The database credentials are more complicated, I would say, because the creation and revocation statements are hard science. When you're creating the temporary credentials and then the application uses those credentials to create tables, update tables, and so on and so on, then when you revoke them, the revocation statement needs to be really clever in order to be able to transfer ownership of those objects that were created to the some other entity. So it is quite complex, but when you nail it, it works as a charm. But it takes time, so be ready for that. Another way, another option you have in the AWS, you have RDS IAM, but there is no access out it because RDS IAM at this moment of time, it doesn't surface in the cloud trail. So it's basically the same from audio perspective, it's more or less the same as a shared username and password. You could rotate all your secrets, like for database, that's some snippet that you could use. Uh, that would allow you to change your root password that you gave to Vault for generate your temporary credentials. And then in this way, only Vault knows the root password, so no one else. Uh, but you can still have a way back of going in the AWS console and reverting root path, password if you really have to, if something happens to Vault. The same with uh, the AWS credentials. You can, I would recommend to obtain them using Terraform, and then every time you rerun, the Terraform will just rege regenerate those keys. There is an API involved to do so, but then Terraform gets confused because it has no idea that you created a new key. It will try to recreate the key that was deleted, and then you might get conflict because it, at some point you can get just too many keys attached to the same user. And as far as I recall, the limit is two. And again, you have to encrypt your and um, protect your Terraform state, so make sure that no one gets in there. Some final thoughts. The Vault introduction is a journey, and it takes quite a long time. And I would recommend starting small, you know, identifying some use case that would improve the security for your organization, and start with that. For instance, you know, the temporary AWS credentials, so you don't have to have static users and manage those. When you're done with that, move on to databases or what have you out there. And when you have the world and you start to build something, that creates a possibility for developers to build security in instead of gluing it afterwards. And since you're doing it all as code, it's all repeatable. You have possibility to check that, yeah, it's what I want, to see the plan, to see the difference, or if there is a, some issue or some incident going on, you have a better way of understanding what's going on. And since you do it as code, it's possible to reuse, to share what you do, like the models I showed you before. And I think that's important that we do share and that we do reuse because by doing so, we're getting more secure, we're getting our respective organization in a better place, meaning that there are less security incidents, there are less data breaches. So let's help each other get more secure and make the internet a better place. 
with that, I'm closing on and available for questions. If you want to ask something afterwards, my credentials is in the left bottom corner of the screen. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy the conference. Thank you.